Thank you very much for uh, asking me to be here. It's, a, it's really a pleasure to, to come to Japan and uh, see the beautiful country and the wonderful food. Um, so I, I actually added to the title Motivation and Challenges. Um, I don't know that we need so much motivation after Opie's talk, but, um, but I think that it's actually useful to, re to remember or to, to look at what it is we, we're trying to solve. And um, I mean, d there are so many, such a diversity of diseases and dis disorders of the nervous system um, across all ages. So across development, across, uh, you know, in adolescent ages, adulthood, and as we age. And um, diseases and disorders of the nervous system comprise about 35% of the annual cost for healthcare, at least in Europe. So this is a strong motivation to address disease in the brain and of course in doing so will also further our understanding of brain and brain function. And just to have another perspective on, on disease and multi-scale, this is, a, this is a map that was published recently in, in PNAS that actually clusters all human diseases uh, with, by the gene that's uh, perturbed by any mutation in a gene. And so what you see is clustered diseases and their relationships based on common gene mutations. And if we zoom into a portion of that, we can see that, in fact, you get quite a wide variety of disease phenotypes coming from uh, common gene mutations. And what this suggests is that clearly we need to have an understanding from the level of the gene to the system to be able to understand uh, diseases as a whole and diseases in the brain. So why do, why do multi-scale modeling? Uh, well, as I mentioned, disease is multi-scale. We also have data from multiple scales. Of course, there's a whole challenge in order to get that data integrated, uh, standardize it. Um, other talks will address that. Um, and the, the challenge is to develop models that can really integrate those multiple scales of data and the relationships between them to help us understand and treat disease. So just as a, a review, some of the processes that, that are actually very relevant to overall system behavior are from gene transcription to translation to proteins, the protein-protein interactions, and of course phosphorylation of uh, proteins. And Upi was also describing some of the signaling processes, but metabolic and signaling processes also play a key role in the cell behavior. Um, all of those during development result in an ultrastructure in, a, in a, the, the membranes and the proteins in the membranes and the, and the uh, subcellular organelles. So this is actually a, a model uh, cell created by Dan Keller in the Blue Brain Project where he's, he's generating 3D meshes and populating them with mesh models of the organelles including the Golgi apparati, the ER, here you see the ER and, and mitochondria and the dendrites. And with these 3D meshes, you can then use, bring this into M cell and populate this with ions and molecules and the reactions necessary to evaluate how the subcellular processes interact within the geometry of individual cells. And then, of course, uh, the multi-compartment electrical modeling is an important part of Blue Brain. Um, this is a model developed by Itai Hai that captures many features of um, the layer 5 pyramidal cell in terms of synaptic integration in the dendrites and uh, s somatic firing properties. And this is another important scale of modeling um, and capturing the behavior of the system. And then, of course, combining the two layers, so one taking the ultrastructure and the, and the 3D geometry that's populated with, uh, in this case, uh, receptor, sorry, the vesicles, and coupling that to the electrical model from neurons, from the neuron simulation, 
And so you see that as this action potential arrives at the presynaptic bouton, you've got an influx of calcium, which then triggers a release of neurotransmitter from the vesicles. And so this is a coupling then between the scales that um, in this case really had to be manually hacked and it was one direction only. So we, we kind of have some of the first steps of interfacing between scales, but, um, but we don't have the tools to really do that in a fully integrated way. And then going further, building up the cortical circuitry, um, in, this again is a, is a movie from the brain where uh, local cortical circuitry is actually constructed by assembling 3D morphologies, reconstructed 3D morphologies, and building up the circuit by identifying the contacts between the, the individual neurons. And when that level is combined, with the electrical model of, uh, that I, I showed earlier, you see th that you get network scale behavior, which then is, of course, dependent upon the individual cell firing properties, the dendritic integration, the synaptic properties, and produces behavior that wasn't explicitly uh, put in to the system. But the goal is, is to keep going and be able to integrate data all the way to, for example, whole brain scale, and uh, now this is not a model, this is actually fMRI data of spontaneous activity in the brain, but ultimately we should be able to achieve models at this scale that really capture the impact of a single gene mutation and its effect on whole brain electrical activity. So there are other aspects of the brain that have multi-scale properties, and some of those were described by Uppi earlier. And um, I mean, one, uh, for example, is just this, the tissue itself is multi-scale in the sense of genes determining proteins, the extracellular matrix, the membrane, organelles, synapses, the neurons, the glia, and then the coupling with the vasculature. And ultimately, all of that forms a, a network that gives rise to uh, to behavior, the neural connectivity as well can be described in multi-scale terms. For example, uh, if you talk about the connectome, this is a very, very broad term, but connectivity, uh, it consists of very precise placements of individual synapses as well as the local circuit connectivity, the mesoscale, axonal arborizations, and the long range projection pathways throughout the brain. So there, there needs to be an ability to capture and, and describe connectivity across these, these different scales. And um, for network behavior, of course, mo molecular activity, receptor activity influences ion channels, the cell firing, the synaptic integration, the connectivity, and the behavior. So these are all important multi-scale processes that need to be captured, need to have a, a, a process for describing. And um, each of those individual scales, each individual model, we, we do, for the most part, have mathematical techniques for describing them now. So, um, but each scale has a different mathematical approach often to, to describing modeling based on the physical laws involved, depending on the level of abstraction. And um, if we review that just from the level of the gene to the brain, um, we've got you know, Markov models, uh, Boolean network models, protein folding models that involve uh, molecular dynamics and quantum mechanics and stochastic diffusion that describes the signal pro signaling pathways, metabolic pathways, differential equations that describe electrical properties. So, so at each level, there are the, the, the mathematics available to describe many of these individual levels and up to, you know, there are mean field descriptions of brain scale activity as well that, uh, that can provide modeling at this point, but there's, there's, no, um, there's no single simulator that actually covers that full scale. Um, now, there are individual simulators that address each scale quite well and with their own model description language. Um, Charm, for example, captures protein uh, folding and molecular dynamics. The 
M cell and steps and Smolden all have molecular level uh, simulation abilities. Moose we heard about before and it is one of the, the few simulators I think that does start to do some of the multi-scale um, but it's it's also uh, batteries not included all the time. Um, but V cell, E cell, there, there are many different simulators that at their own individual scales capture important uh, models and modeling properties but um, there is a real need for a unified multi-scale modeling framework. Um, so, and that would consist of a common language for describing models at different scales, but also the relationship between scales. So how do you actually take the state of one individual scale and map it to another? And uh, in doing that, having a unified multi-scale framework can allow you to potentially take advantage of this diversity of specialized simulators at different levels if they support the, the, the same multi-scale modeling framework and maybe linked by music which is uh, developed by the INCF to, to couple these simulators you could use uh, one unified mo modeling framework to, to capture that across uh, all these different scales but the, it would also enable the development of a single simulator if that was of interest to, to actually do full multi-scale modeling consistently um, within one framework. So what, what are some of the things that a multi-scale language should provide? Well we don't have a multi-scale language yet um, but clearly some of the elements should be to, to provide facilities for describing uh, structure and space in, in great detail, capturing the geometry uh, in, in either detailed or simplified forms so that you can actually uh, have a full expressiveness for the spatial constraints of a model. Uh, in addition, I know UPI has done, done some work in this area of actually having models that change structure from activity. And that's an important aspect as well of multi-scale. If you want to have a developmental model or if you want to have a, a plasticity model that's actually altering the morphology of a synapse or, or a, um, spine, you'll want to have the ability to modify structure. And of course, at each scale, there are dynamics, individual states that need to be updated and characterized and solved in their own uh, individual way. And the, similarly, modeling the relationship of the states, as I mentioned before, at different spatial and temporal scales allows you to take a given scale and relate it to another. And this is, a ver this is very much an undeveloped area. Um, there, are, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of questions there in terms of how to, how to do that. One aspect that can facilitate multi-scale is to have a well-defined ontology. Um, now, as many of you are aware, an ontology, this is actually paraphrased from a Stephen Larson's paper, a recent paper in Frontiers in Neuroscience, but an ontology is a formal representation of knowledge in a domain, and ontologies consist of a set of classes that represent concepts within that domain and the relationships among these classes. Well, what that means is that if you've got an ontology for the, to help you standardize the naming and the relationships between the elements at, uh, in the brain, you've, you've got the tool you need to, re to reference the elements and their relationships for a multi-scale model description. So this is an important, uh, ontology is going to be an important part of being able to maintain the references and the relationships for um, multi-scale description. So some of the examples of what I mean of relating between scales, one, some very simple ones are, for example, if you want to relate concentrations of ions to voltage, the Nernst equation already exists and handles that perfectly well. Um, to relate individual cell electrical activity to a local field potential, Coulomb's law allows you to take the current sources and compute the, the field potential from that for a, for a model neuron. And of course, relating a population of spiking cells to a mean uh, firing rate model is quite trivial. You average the firing rate and, and that's, that's all moving 
uh, very easily from a fine-grained to a coarse-grained model. And the challenge is that so we, you can do, imagine that generally it's fairly straightforward to move from fine scale to, to coarse scale because you're, you're, you're compressing information, you're losing information about the detail. The problem comes when you want to go and say initialize a fine scale model from a coarse scale model. And so if you take a voltage and you say I want to now populate my detailed model with ions, it's, it's a non-trivial problem and there's no unique solution. And so you need additional constraints to determine how to do that. And um, so there, there are some real challenges facing multi-scale modeling at, at this level. So th there's also a desire to have a language that's simulator independent so that you can use heterogeneous simulators and so that you, you have a model description that is in fact independent of the specific solving method. Um, what particular time step you choose, the particular manipulations or, ex or simulated experiment you want to perform with that model. And so that's why we would suggest a declarative model description really would be the answer because what it, what it does is it provides a, a set of definitions or equations that describe the relationships and what exactly needs to be computed without specifying how that computation should occur. And so it, it really is focused on model description without telling you what needs to be solved or making assumptions about any specific time point or time resolution uh, used in, this, in the solving. And so 9ML, which Chung will speak about now, is, is actually a new modeling language that's starting to be developed. Uh, it started, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where we can start talking about it and explain what the principles of it. It's not yet multi-scale. Um, this is coming out of the task force on um, multi-scale modeling in the, in the program for, from the INCF. And it's structured so that we will be able to extend it to handle multi-scale concepts. And that's, um, that's something I look forward to seeing the, the presentation. And thank you very much. Are there questions? works, yes. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you, you touched upon ontologies in the context of, um, of modeling. And um, there are many opinions on ontologies. One opinion is clearly that it's needed to deal with data within the level or and the cross levels. Another aspect is that ontologies is very complex. And some people would say this is impossible because the nature of science is that we will change our perspective all the time. We will create new definitions, new elements coming up. Well, then you can approach that by flexible ontologies, of yes. course. <laughs> uh, but still, how do you, from a modeler's perspective, consider this enormous challenge with, with this enormous complexity within the level and the challenge of dealing with the ontology at each level? Is granularity a way of thinking about it that we need to coarse and fine? And what are your thoughts about that? Because it's probably quite important in terms of making progress. No, I think I think a core issue is to be, especially in developing a model, is not to be uh, tied to a fixed ontology and to have, as you're suggesting, a flexible ontology, and to be able to uh, to. Uh, of course, modeling is a very dynamic process unto itself. And you're cho when you're updating a model, you're making certain assumptions even about an ontology. Um, and so the, the key thing is, is, is being able to have a reference that you can tie things to that, that at least gives you the relationships. Right? It, this will not be a fixed relationship. This will change from week to week, month to month, year to year. Um, ideally, it will all settle down and, and people will start to agree. But that it's a tool for essentially capturing which pieces belong at which scale. And that's an important tool and, and it's those relationships that you want to be able to capture. So it's, 
it, it's certainly non-trivial to have a definitive ontology, but as a tool, as a modeling tool, and as a mechanism for maintaining, and, and especially when you're doing multi-scale modeling, maintaining the relationships that capture scale, an ontology is a very important tool. At the risk already of sounding like a broken record about <laughs> uh, this, what sort of data types would be ideal for, for multi-scale integration? You mentioned ontology is sort of a, a infrastructure, but what actual data would you need to integrate across scales? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, of course, multimodal data, so data that captures the same phenomena from different scales, um, is ideal. It's very rare that you get that. Um, I mean, we were talking about connectivity, for example, and if you're able to look at connectivity, uh, this, the same connectivity at, um, say, very fine scale and, and, and at a coarser scale between two populations of cells, you get individual, local, precise synaptic positions and you get broader uh, patterns and probabilities of connection. I mean, this is, this is useful, but I mean, it's, you always need to have enough information to, to be able to relate the scales and that's a, that's a real challenge for science as a whole to be able to capture those relationships so with modeling you can you can you can use one scale to bootstrap another and show how much do you understand in uh, between scales to see if if i put in i mean this is what most modeling is doing now right it's that you're modeling at one particular scale and you're seeing well do i get behavior or activity at another scale that is consistent with what I've measured, right? So, for example, in a network of neurons, you know, you, 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 you look and you see if you've got individual, well, you wanted to follow no, no, up? Go ahead, I'm just standing up to... <laughs> but you, you get individual um, firing properties, and when you, when you build a network out of this, do you get the local field potential that corresponds to that population of neurons? And being able to measure from the biology both the local field potential and the individual unit activity is the key to being able to see that you can relate between those scales. Um, you know, David mentioned the simplicity of genetic data in comparison with neuroscience. And one of the simple things that a geneticist can do is collapse time and just treat a human as a steady state system. So if you inherit a specific number of CAG repeats in the Huntington gene, you will have this disease and you don't have to worry about all those intermediate domains, nor do you really have to worry about the dynamics too much. You might say disease onset will be at 50 plus or minus five years if you have this many CAG repeats. Um, and that, that is a great example of going across scales very easily. So you yeah, get right, from right. CAG repeat to disease onset, and that's what we neuroscientists would love to do. So it's kind of, um, interesting to think about why it is that geneticists can do this multi-scale integration, how they cheat yeah. to get the answers they need, the predictive utility. And when Lee Hood is here, we're going to hear quite a bit, I guess, about 4P medicine. Um, there are some cheats that neuroscientists have open to them yeah. that, that are the same type. The ultimate multi-scale integrator to me is a correlation coefficient. I know we hate to hear about correlation <laughs> coefficients, but they're a terrific way to, to bind one scale to the other. So, uh, see, that uh, was a great talk. Uh, so, I have just one question. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I take? Um, <clears throat> uh, which concerns, I guess, the, uh, the section about multi scale modeling. And this is, I mean, I think the problem is also there is not only that the batteries are not included, there's another problem if you actually want to run the entire thing. Because, I mean, what we know from physics is that some, um, some, some structure of, on, on, on a microscopic scale trickles up to a macro, macroscopic phenomenon and others do not. And uh, if you think of simulating a mole of gas, right, I mean, uh, there, are, uh, there are basically phase transitions that you can understand without looking at the microscopic structure. And so I think that, that the problem also is to run these models there is some theoretical work needed to find out actually what kind of microscopic structure 
is, is averaging out in what actually trickles up to the next level. And I'm wondering if, if you think about these things or if people think about this, because it's not just plugging together all these different scales. Sure. I mean, the, I think that's an important point. The, the challenge is, is that under which conditions do these have an effect, right? And, and you obviously have to do an enormous number of perturbations and evaluations to see, well, when is it that a very small effect can actually have a, a macroscopic effect? So that's a uh, um, A comment. Uh, Mount scale is, of course, very important. But, and, and you can apply that uh, most simply to, uh, to my, at the micro circuit level. I mean, you, you can go from, from uh, gene products to cell to synaptic interaction to network. And if you take uh, networks on the motor side, you can link that easily to, to behavior also. So, so, so that's an example where it's quite realistic to go from gene product to behavior. It doesn't capture all aspects of the nervous system, but, but action is, of, of course, one important aspect. And wouldn't it be nice to have one mo modeling language that lets you do that? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Maybe it's just that I'm jet lagged, um, but I'm afraid that my sense is that we may have lost the thread of what I think your message may have been. That is that in the challenge of multiscale, and dealing with the temporal range of scales, the spatial range of scales, we need some frameworks. Yes. Okay. Yes. There are examples out there yep. from other communities that are helping to bridge between disciplinary views of complex information. One is the markup language approach that makes things translatable between computer scientists and mere mortals and allows you to exchange descriptions. Mm -hmm. Another very important framework is, uh, of course, the systems biology type framework that fits into that, where you can look at and compute on networks. Another that you mentioned, which most people are scared of because the word is complicated, is ontology, which mm -hmm. is another way of putting things in some sort of a hierarchy of framework. And what I missed from your talk, and so here comes the question, is where is the, the 9ML beginning to emerge as a working group right. to address what frameworks are useful to help us understand where are the gaps? What do we really need to work on first in order to do practical work? It's, a, it's an important question, and I think, I mean, Chung's presentation will give you an idea of the, the state of 9ML. Um, but I think what's important is that in, in moving forward in designing and in, in planning for 9ML, we're keeping in mind the requirements of multiscale. At this stage, 9ML is focused on large-scale networks of point neurons. Okay? So this, this is just the beginning. And we, so we can describe you know, state of individual point neurons and synapses and describe connectivity between them. But this is, this is done in such a way so that there's a very explicit description of that state and in a way that you know, the, the plan is to develop the language to be able to do multi-compartment and relate between each level of detail to be able to, to build models of more sophistication and of different spatial and temporal scales. So. Okay, we should move on. Thank you again, Sean.